Welcome to episode number 11 of the Roar Rundown Sports Podcast. I'm Chris Gay, your host, joined by my co-host, Zach Cloud. Thank you for being with us. Now, we have a little bit to talk about. It was sort of a lighter week in Washington sports. Both it's going to be a heavy week, actually this week and especially this weekend, and we'll talk about that to cap off our program. But we're going to get started first with Washita Volleyball. So this has been the talk of the conference because Washita is well known if you follow Great American Conference Volleyball. They started off hot. Well, okay. Washita started off really slow and they had a 3-6 and six conference record coming into their game against Oklahoma Baptist a couple weeks ago. They beat Oklahoma Baptist. That was a big deal because Oklahoma Baptist was number three, no, number two in the conference at that point. And Washita was maybe ninth or tenth. And they needed a win to even be in contention to sneak into the conference. We just had a spot. Back. Just no, back yeah, exactly. Back. We got that win against Oklahoma Baptist, then SNU, then win at Monticello, and then guess what? We got. I guess this is our fourth straight conference win against Harding. And what's crazy about that is that Harding was number one heading into that game. They're no longer number one anymore. Last time I checked, they were in a three-way tie for, I think, the second spot. Uh, or actually, maybe still the three-way tie for the number one spot. I imagine that's changed since then. But what was interesting about that, Harding has been one of the best if not the best team in volleyball in the great american conference for a number of years now and that's just become expected washington had not beat harding since 2019 and they had not swept them since 1988 which uh is just shocking well i, I was shocked that we swept them i mean and chase hartzell and i were on the call for that game and oh man, the, it was a fantastic atmosphere. Everybody was out there supporting that squad. It was just a heck of a game. But uh, look at some of the stats. I mean, Harding still forced Washita to, to hit under 20%. But um, I mean, Washita's defense came to play. And also, Harding just really never looked. I don't know. It was just like they did. I don't want to say they didn't come ready to play. It was just they they had a bunch of mistakes right at first, and they just never recovered from them. So they didn't even hit at. They weren't even at 100 hitting percentage wise, and they had 35 errors, which was nine more than Washita. And um, but another storyline was Courtney Hansen, uh, and I think she she's still the number one assist leader in the conference, and has. I think coming into that game was number 12 in the country in assist, and she might be a little bit higher. She had 30 assists in those three sets. Harding had 25 total assists. So, and and you know that's not even accounting for all the other players from Washita that got a couple of assists. But if you want to break down some of our offensive leaders uh, outside of just Hanson. Yeah, uh, Emily Adams. She brought in eight kills. Leah Gardner, seven kills and three block assists, and she also had a service ace. Courtney Hansen, you know, like Chris said, along with her 30 assists, she had three kills and two service aces. And uh, these numbers are, like, slightly lower than, I guess, what we're used to seeing, but that's because we only played three sets. We were able to, like Chris mentioned earlier, we were able to sweep Harding. So um, it's kind of a given that their numbers were going to be a, a tad bit down since they played less games. Well, and can't forget about Kayla Steinmeier, too. She had 11 kills, a block, and she hit 318. Yeah. So just fantastic night from her. Uh, and then Washita women's soccer, this was on Wednesday. They defeated East Central in Ada 2-1. to one. And uh, Washita, just kind of looking at the numbers. Now, East Central, their defense was really good. I mean, around the, the goal, obviously, they did allow two, two goals, but... They did save, uh, record 14 saves. But Wachita, I think their offense just overwhelmed them. I mean, they had 16 shots on goal out of 22 total shots and only five for East Central. Now, this was a big game because final game of the regular season for women's soccer. And they what they needed to do was get a win to try to propel themselves. They had already clinched. Wachita had already clinched in the conference tournament but they really wanted to try to get home advantage, home field advantage. They did not get it, 
So the conference tournament will be in Shawnee, Oklahoma, because Oklahoma Baptist won out the conference. So, uh, or actually, it was number one. So they, um, so they get home field advantage. So Washita is going to be playing them pretty soon. But at least Washita helped themselves a little bit by getting that road win. And uh, uh, Reese Brown and Jamie Fowler scored uh, those two goals. For Brown, it was her third goal of the season. For Fowler, it was her sixth goal of the season. Well, Washita Wrestling had their first match of the season. They didn't exactly start out strong coming off with a loss to Central Oklahoma, and that was in Little Rock on Wednesday. But they did come back with a win. Well, I wouldn't say it's a win. You know, it was just a, it was the Dan Harris Open. But they did have a couple uh, wrestlers that did win their weight divisions, those being Jalon Otero and Donald Paul. And they also had five other Tigers that finished in the top three in their weight divisions as well. So, interested to see how wrestling's going to be able to do for the rest of the season. But let's go back to volleyball. You know, that's what we've been talking about a lot is just how hot they've been of late. Well, they continued that hot streak versus Southern Arkansas. And Southern Arkansas is a very good volleyball team. And this team, um, I think they were at the time number five uh, or maybe number six in the conference. And Washtal was right behind them. And, um, you know, Washtenaw needed that win to get themselves up over past SAU, and that's exactly what happened. They beat them 3-1 to one on Thursday, and it was also senior night for Washita. And a few seniors that were being honored, Kayla Steinmeier, Kellen Church, um, Zahara Thomas, and E.J. Day. Now, Day and Thomas did not play. I think Day may be out with an injury. Uh, and then Thomas has not played this season. She's been dealing with injuries the last couple of years. But just kind of going over a couple of their accomplishments. So Steinmeier has been one of the staples in that Washita offense ever since she first came onto campus. So she was a distinguished scholar athlete in 2022, but she has 841 career kills, which is 2.5 career kills per set. Uh, 112 total blocks for her career and 322 career digs. Now EJ Day, she was also GAC All Academic in 2022. She has 397 career kills, two, that's about 2.2 2 kills per set, 30 career service aces and 39 career blocks. Kellen Church, she had 49 service aces in 2021 which is third on OVU single season uh, record. And before Courtney Hansen, she was the setter for Washita, and she has 937 career assists, 72 career kills, uh, 104 career service aces, and uh, so far she has 28 this season, and then she's also two time all academic. And then Zahara Thomas has 52 career kills and 31 career blocks. Now, when, uh, excuse me, men's soccer, they finished out their season. They did not finish it out on a loss. They did finish it out on a tie versus a very good Northeastern State team. And it was also at Northeastern State. This was on Thursday. Um, Zach, I know that Washita did not come away with the win, but at least just looking briefly at the stats, it's still a serviceable, a valiant effort, if you will by the Tigers. Oh yeah, um, the first thing that kind of jumps out is uh, Northeastern State, they had 21 shots, 12 of them were shots on goal and they still didn't score a single goal, it was still ended 0-0 tied, so um, our defense really came to play, our keeper was playing amazing, um, and we only we only had seven fouls, Northeastern State actually only had two fouls, which is extremely low, but seven for OBU is also low, so it was evident that we been kind of keying in on that and focusing on that number. Well, Washita men and women's cross country, they finished out the cross country season in Joplin, Missouri at the NCAA Regionals, and they both performed pretty pretty well considering, you know, playing against other, or performing against other Division II teams throughout the country, or throughout at least, well, not the country, but the region. So the women finished 15th out of 31 teams, and the men finished 18th out of 29 teams, um, and the women finished third among GAC 
teams and the men finished fourth amongst uh, GAC teams. Uh, the top runner for the women was Macy Cash who finished the 6K 36 overall with a time of 21 minutes 54 seconds .63 which that time ranked second all-time in Washita women's cross-country history, so congratulations, Cash. Wow. That's, that's tough, and considering the, the women's cross-country team has been around a lot longer than the men's team, because I, I want to say the men's team, it had been 20 years uh, that the men's cross-country did not exist. I think it existed, obviously, 20 years ago, but mm -hmm. it had a long just period of just not existing. And it's new as of, I guess, 2021. Yeah. And they've done really well. Oh, yeah. They've been building up the program. They really have. And um, so they had several finishers as well. Um, but, of course, Washita Women's, they had uh, Mackenzie Davis finish 70th. Allison Hilkema finish 77th. Izzy Bro finished uh, 79th. And Lucy Holden finished 92nd. The men's top runner was Gabriel Green, uh, Greenwich, who finished in 80th, and of course, I know these are high numbers, but they're competing against hundreds yeah. of, of there's uh, lots of schools, lots of yeah. people for each school. So yeah, there's tons of runners each race. So. I mean, I had said 31 teams and women, oh, yeah. and you know, who, and they're bringing pretty much their whole rosters. Yeah. You're they're all at, competing. There's hundreds of people you're running yeah. against. So. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. Evan Armitage took 85th. Uh, Dylan Dew finished uh, 97th. Kate Swindle finished 99th, and Noah Embry finished 116th. And uh, now a lot of Tigers will, they're, it, you know, some of them are seniors, so their they're running careers are not over. Some of them are going to put, compete this spring in track and field, so that should be interesting. And we'll see that coming up next in uh, 2024. Now, Washington football defeated Oklahoma Baptist. It was also senior day at home. 55 to 14, and I gotta say, there was one guy that just sort of blew me away, and he's on the cover of the latest issue, the November 2nd issue of The Signal. Number this 34. guy. Yep, number 34, Kendall Givens, of course. This article that was written by Chase R. Hartzell, a great article, and uh, it basically just talked about his his journey coming and being now Washington's career rushing touchdown leader, yeah. he just added to that. I joked with him when I had my interview with him a, co a couple weeks back. I was like, you know, can you get 55? Can you break 60? He might actually oh, break God. 60. I mean, he, shot yeah, he had four rushing touchdowns in this game alone, and I'm pretty sure he had a career high in rushing yards in the first half. <laughs> I mean, he finished with 199 rushing yards on uh, nine yards a carry, but I think he had upwards of 180, 70 something in that first half alone. It was just incredible, Monster incredible. Game. Yep. And uh, Washita was without Riley Harms. They were resting him, and he was dealing with a bruised knee. Uh, at least that's what was said on the broadcast. But so they turned to Eli Livingston, who's played a good amount this season. Uh, he's he, he is a backup quarterback, but he's just one of those backups you stick in because he's a he's a versatile runner. Oh yeah, he he deserves to be on the field, so we always find ways to get him on the field. Well, he showed it as a passer. Now he didn't have a passing touchdown, uh, but he he didn't throw an interception. He was only sacked once and was 13 of 19 for 157 yards. But the re we would have thrown with him more. If it wasn't for the fact that Washington's rushing attack had seven total touchdowns, yeah, in a game like that, you don't you don't have you don't even have to rely on your quarterback as much. So, uh, you know, a guy like Eli, you know, you may you may it may look like we changed up our play style because we had a backup quarterback in, but that's not the case at all. Eli's shown you know season for multiple seasons now that he's capable of getting the job done. We just found something that was working against Oklahoma Baptist and ran with it. So. Like Chris said, Kendall had four touchdowns by himself, but as a team, we had seven rushing touchdowns compared to Oklahoma Baptist zero. So that's easily the difference in the game. Um, OBU, like I said, he had Eli. Eli he had 159 pass yards. Oklahoma Baptist had 227. So not a big difference there. Um, but on third down, we completed half of our conversions, six of 12. And on fourth down, we went for it once, and we also got that. But 
the one of the key stats is in the red zone, you know, every time you get in the red zone, you're trying to punch it in the end zone. You, obviously, you want to take your points, but you prefer to get touchdowns, and we converted eight eight times out of every. We got to the red zone eight times, and we scored all eight of those times. So, um, obviously, if you put up 55 points, it's going to be hard to stop stop your offense. Well, it certainly is, and only two of those times were ended in field goals. So, yeah, the other six ended up being touchdowns. But uh, another, you know, heading into Part of the other facet of the game is the, the defense. Oklahoma Baptist threw three interceptions and had two two fumbles, yeah. and Washita had one one turnover. Oh yeah, five turnovers. Yes, yeah. that's that's monster game for the defense. Yeah, you're. I, I don't think there's very many instances where a team puts up that many turnovers and doesn't come out oh, with yeah. a loss. I mean, seriously. So, um, and. There were a couple big names on that defense, and actually several of them are seniors, but one guy that uh, really had a good game was Dawson Miller. He was a senior, being honored on senior day. He had nine total tackles. He had one of those interceptions. It was actually only the second of his career, and he had a couple pass deflections. Uh, Jax Miller had eight tackles. Josiah Johnson had an interception and seven tackles. Mario Ganter Jr. has been just a ball hawk all season long, and he had an interception. And actually, it was interesting. I was at the game, and I, I, I saw the play, uh, or actually what led up to that interception. He had a, a pretty blatant pass interference call, and it was one of those, I think it was like second or third down, we had him. And it was just one of those, it was like, come on, man, you know, really? And then he comes back and gets that interception. It's like, okay, you're Makes okay important. now. Yeah. So he, he had a phenomenal game. But Brock Baker, primarily been a special teamer. He had three tackles and a fumble recovery. And then Malik Relaford had forced one of those fumbles and recovered it as well. Now, um, one guy, I don't think we can go on uh, a broadcast without mentioning the best wide receiver in the Great American Conference being Connor Flanagan. He did not find the end zone, didn't need to. He still had seven catches and 69 yards. I don't think there's been a game where he's not led the team in both catches and receiving yards. Yeah. But um, a name that we have really not talked about that got some opportunities in this game, and it wasn't even because Washita was leading by a lot, is Boogie Carr. Uh, he's a true freshman out of Conway, I believe. And yes, he was a former Wampus Cat. And um, and I don't know if you follow high school football, but they lost to Bryant. Yeah. That was that was that was big. It's so a big deal to see Bryant's able to do that given their new head coaching situation. Well, and it, it's interesting because you know Conway has the old Bryant coach, mm -hmm. Buck James. So that was a little maybe maybe a little bit of. Some more bad blood between that game. I don't know. It was it. It was one of those games. One of those games that more personal. Oh yeah. Well, it's one of those games that everybody was going to be talking about regardless. Yeah. yeah. And like Greenwood was playing Little Rock Christian. That's another great game. That would have been like the game everybody would have talked about if Brian and Conway weren't matching up. Yeah. But anyway, Boogie Carr had 61 uh, yards on the ground, and then uh, he also had uh, eight receiving yards. But he had seven carries and a touchdown. Uh, and I think this, this is only the second game. I don't know if it's only the second game that he's played, but it's only the second game that he's recorded any stats. Uh, Isaac Edwards also found the end zone. Uh, Eli Livingston found the end zone. Chris Henley had a few carries, and then even Lyric Treadwell, who hasn't played much at all this year, he also had a carry. But um, And then even a guy that we haven't seen much at all this season, Jalen McKinney, former uh, Pulaski Academy Bruin, he had a 20-yard reception. And uh, so we got to see a lot of young guys this game. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, a lot of young guys got to see play really well. A lot of older guys that got to play well that we've seen get honored. As I mentioned, Dawson Miller is one of those guys. He has 146 career tackles, five sacks for his career, and like I said, two career interceptions. It's a three-time all-academic uh, teamer. Gabe Goodman, he was uh, perfect on the day. He was 7-7 seven seven point after attempts and then 2-2 two of two from field goal range. Uh, for his career, he's uh, hit about 75% of his field goals. He's three-time GAC honorable mention. Uh, he's hit the school record field goal 
Uh, it was 55 yards this season against the Rangers, and then he's a multiple time Great American Conference Special Team Player of the Week, and also a reigning uh, Special Teamer of the Week. And so is uh, Kendall Gibbons. He also was recognized for Player of the Week. Uh, Trey Proctor, he has 111 tackles for his career, seven tackles for a loss. Actually, six of them are this in this season alone. He has two career interceptions, and uh, he has switched from safety to linebacker. It seems like for the better because he has a career high in tackles this season with 55. Dante Gibson was honored. He had 77 career tackles, two interceptions, and uh, also eight pass deflections in his career as a, a kind of a rotational safety for Washita. Cole Turner, he has, uh, he's played in nine career games, mostly on special teams, but he's collected four tackles, and he's also a two-time GAC All-Academic. All uh, Brock Howard, he did not play in this game. He's been dealing with an injury. He's only played in two games this season, but uh, last year was the full-time starting fullback for Washita, and it was a staple of that run offense, you know, where T.J. Cole got the, the Darren McFadden Award, and then Kendall Gibbons had 13 rushing touchdowns, so um, he's been a staple. You know, we use a traditional type of an old-school offense using that fullback quite a bit. Uh, Josh Watson, uh, backup tight end, was honored. He was three-time GAC All-Academics, all and he's only played in three games this season. He did play in this last game. Uh, I think one of those possessions he came in blocked and led to a touchdown, a first down or something. Jarvis Goley, uh, he's a first time, first year starter for Washington. He's been starting I think at left guard and he's done an excellent job. Uh, he also has a one career reception uh, that was this season at ECU. Uh, didn't go anywhere but at least he can say he caught a pass. Uh, Zach Henson was one of the guys that was expected to be one of the best in the country, and he is uh, started at left tackle this season. Uh, he's a um, all GAC first teamer last season. It's been a two-time GAC all all academic, and was named to the Division II Football Elite 100 watch list to start the season. And so was Joe Couch, our punter, who was honored as well. Uh, he's also a D2 double uh, CA All American second teamer in 2022. Uh, has 73, 73 career punts uh, for a 44.6 average. Uh, he has 28 punts inside the 20. 25 punts have gone 50 yards or, plus, or, or more. Nate Turner, uh, he's been with Washita since 2018. He's a three year starter for Washita's offensive line. And uh, he's been he's been great. He's been playing uh, center and right guard this this season. I think he spent all year last year at center. All right, so let's get into our Tiger Prowl preview. So everybody knows about the football game that's going to be going on this Saturday, but volleyball is also playing their Battle of the Ravine matchup. Of course, they played Henderson earlier this season and at at home, but they're playing actually. At the moment of this filming here on Monday, they are playing right at this moment. So I don't know how that game is going right now, but they're playing across the street at Henderson. Um, so I'm really interested to see if they're able to keep up their winning streak. But regardless, I think Washita has clinched a spot in the conference tournament. OBU Wrestling, they will compete at Carl Albert State on Wednesday and on Friday at 6 p.m. I uh, don't know about the time for Friday, though. Washita Women's Soccer, they play Southern Nazarene in the GAC Championship Tournament in Shawnee. That will be Thursday at 6 p.m. If, if they can beat Southern Nazarene, the women will move on to the championship game on Sunday in Shawnee at 2 p.m. So definitely would love to see the women's team win out the conference. That would be amazing. Washita Volleyball will play Arkansas Tech in Russellville on Thursday at 6 p.m. And then on Friday, men and women swim and dive. They travel to Edmond, Oklahoma, and they're going to compete at Oklahoma, or excuse me, Oklahoma Christian. Uh, and like I said, Friday, but that will be through Sunday. And finally, 
Washtenaw basketball is about to tip off. Uh, it will be tipping off Friday. So the first game will be uh, women's basketball. They will be playing at, or actually they'll be playing at home versus Champion Christian out of Hot Springs on Friday at 6 p.m. And that's going to be their season opener. Um, and then men's basketball, they traveled to Fort Smith to participate in the GAC MIAA Conference Challenge. That tips off Friday as well. 7.30 p.m. versus Central Missouri. They will also play the very next day, also a part of the challenge, at 6 p.m. versus Lincoln. And then finally, Washita football, Battle of the Ravine, this Saturday at 1 p.m. And, you know, this is especially special for me because this is my last Battle of the Ravine as a student here. Um, and I guess it'll be the last one for you at home as well because, yeah. you know, yeah. they're going to be at Henderson next season. That's true. Um, but, yeah, I've only been to one, and it was in 2021. That one was one of the best um, Battle of the Ravines we've ever had because that was a season where Kendall Givens and TJ Cole were outstanding. Yeah. And I don't even know what they did in that game. I know they were great. But I'll tell you what everybody does remember about that game, which is Gabe Goodman. Yeah, I was about to say that. Probably having the kick of his life, he kicked, uh, I don't remember exactly how long it was. It was, 50, it was at least 50. Was, yeah. He kicked a 50-something yard field goal as time expired to yeah. beat Henderson. Everybody rushes on the field. It was crazy. Yeah. Well, and what was crazy was they Henderson called a timeout right yeah. before Goodman. And Goodman, I don't know if it was because maybe he was deflected or he just wasn't trying, but they called a timeout to ice him. And then he kicks it, and it's a, it doesn't For even sure. get close. Yeah, and I was, I, was, um, I was a sophomore, so I was, do, I was running camera there in the press box, and I was like, oh, this, this is not good. Yeah. And I had my doubts, and I'm glad I was wrong, because yeah. coming out of the timeout, Goodman drilled it, yeah. and it looked like it had some yards to go, so oh, maybe yeah. it was just... It would have been good from longer. Oh, yeah. So, and then, you know, knocked off Anderson, and uh, uh, so that, you know, it's always great to beat Anderson, but on a finish like that. And then last year's game at Henderson also ended on a game-winning touchdown by Washington. Fashion. In overtime. Yeah, yes. I think it was uh, T.J. Cole that it got was. a rushing touchdown, and uh, what was crazy was that we stormed their feet. I know. Yeah, that was, that was probably the, that was the first time I've ever stormed. I think in a way teams field, it was awesome. But yeah, you don't hear that yeah. much. You but I mean, we we were excited. We were down with like I think about four and a half minutes left. We got the ball and we were down by fourteen, and we still we drove down and scored, got the stop we needed, scored again at the last second, and then went to overtime, stopped them, and then punched it in with T.J. Cole. It was it was textbook. Well, I remember I was at home and I was watching the game and we got down. And it's funny, I was with my girlfriend and her family. We were going to an escape room yeah. in like Little Rock. And um, I was watching it on the phone, on my phone, and we were down, and I was like, all right, you know, Henderson's going to get a win. Because they were up by maybe three scores in like the fourth quarter. It was something ridiculous. And I, didn't, I just was like, you know, I, I'm not so sure. And then I looked again to see if the game was over. It was not. Washita yeah. was like yeah, about to win. And I was like, oh my gosh. And we were like, they were trying to get into the escape room, but it's like, no, 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 no. I got <laughs> yeah. I, I to finish yeah. this game. We got some priorities. I could not finish the game. But Washita got the win. So uh, that's always great. So it's going to be great. And also uh, tune into the pregame, uh, OSDN's pregame um, on Saturday, because we have a couple very special guests that uh, I think everybody, maybe even in the country, is going to want to hear from. But, uh, you know, we'll see about that. But uh, if you want to, you know, know who those special guests are, tune in Saturday. So we're going to end our segment here with the GAC Overachiever segment. NFL season's been, you know, right sort of in the middle of it. And a couple guys that have mentioned earlier this year um, both had the games of their lives uh, in the NFL. I don't even know what week it is for the NFL. Was it like week nine or something uh, like that? I think, yeah, it's either week nine or ten. Okay. Well, Saguna Luby, former linebacker for Harding, he transferred out and went to San Diego State. He plays for the Colts, 
and he's played a little bit this season. I think this is only his fourth game of the season. He had six tackles, a tackle for loss, and an interception in Sunday's win over the Panthers. He has 13 tackles on the season, but that tackle for loss, he had half a tackle for loss earlier this season, but that interception is the first of his career, and six tackles as a career high for him. So congratulations. That's pretty to cool. Getting yeah. to say you intercept the reigning Heisman winner, you know, yeah, the number, one, the overall number one overall pick. Yeah. pick and yeah. Being able to pick them off in a game, that's that's pretty legit. Well, it's obviously big because they're, you know, Colts are still without yeah. Anthony Richards. Yeah, and the Colts, so. the Colts are fighting for wins right now. So that was, yeah. he played a crucial part in that game. Well, they're in a division where it's anybody's game. Yeah. I mean, with Houston, Houston's probably going to win out. Yeah, that that's division. what it's looking like. But, you know, you got Tennessee and uh, who's it? Who's the other team? I, I keep forgetting. Is it, uh, is it the Ravens? Or no? no. Houston, Tennessee. Uh, Indianapolis. I'm not sure. Shoot. That's a good question to look up. But, yeah, so he had a fantastic performance on Sunday. Another guy that had a fantastic performance on Sunday was Tanner Hudson. He's a tight end for the Bengals. The Jaguars. Jaguars, so of course. They'll probably take the division. Okay, but yeah, never mind. Whoever comes in second could still squeeze in a wild card. Yeah, it's, so. it's definitely possible. I think it's going to be Colts or Texans. The Colts still have a capable quarterback in Minshew. So. Uh, but Tanner Hudson tied in for the Bengals. He's been back and forth, being called up and down on the practice squad for the Bengals. Uh, he's played, he's, he's sort of an NFL veteran. He's played for a bunch of teams. Uh, but he had four catches for 45 yards on five targets in their win over the Bills on Sunday. Uh, and that was the most targets, catches, maybe not yards, but or maybe all of those numbers were career highs for, for Hudson. He's former tight end out of Southern Arkansas, was a fantastic player there. Uh, he has eight catches and 93 yards on the season. So uh, congratulations to both of you guys. Just keep up the hard work. Haven't seen anything from Gregory Jr. I think he's still dealing with some injuries, so but he's still on the Jaguars roster, so that's still good to see. But well, that's going to do it from us. Uh, it was just kind of a quicker episode. I say quicker, but I think this still took quite a, a little while. But uh, thank you again for tuning in. We're going to have an action-packed. Um, episode next week for episode oh, yeah. number 12. It's Battle of the Ravine Week. Yep. Well, it's, it once a year. Yep. Battle of the Ravine Week. Uh, well, you know, Guard the Tiger has been going on, if you're yeah. not familiar with that. Uh, every Is it every social club just switches out different days, or? Uh, I know they go by grades. Oh, so that's right. Yeah. Rose Sig, they guard it. It's kind of like their thing. Oh, Rose Sig right. guards it about every night, I think. But tomorrow, the seniors will start. And then Wednesdays designated for juniors, Thursday sophomores, and then Friday the biggest night is for freshmen. But you know everybody still comes out and shows out and hangs out, has a good time. And then I think all the social clubs will have tables and stuff set okay. up on Friday I night. Gotcha. So yeah, because so, it's for the freshmen, and that way the freshmen kind of get a feel for all the clubs, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a great tradition, and uh, it's you know, this is a storied rivalry because uh, not just from the sports perspective, but from the student life perspective, because the reason why Guard the Tiger is a big thing, there's a big tiger statue in the middle of campus, and it already has a, a gate around it with security cameras because it's been uh, vandalized Can't by some reddies a few times, but um, they, obviously a security camera is not gonna stop anybody, so <laughs> they, uh, you know, Watchdog has, you know, the students just camp out overnight in front of the tiger and protect it and they've done a pretty good job except last year Henderson students were able to sneak on campus and put dye in that fountain. They got in the, the fountain. The fountain, which, the fountain which, which don't know how that happens. You got hundreds of people I out know, there on the lawn. I know. Like, they must have done it at like 3 or 4 a.m. Yeah. when everybody's asleep because... But still it's, it's fun. <sighs> yeah and I know that it was kind of a pain for, for maintenance <laughs> to clean out because yeah. I I think it broke the fountain for a couple of weeks, but <laughs> put it out of commission. Yeah, we don't even ruin their fountain in no. the front of the campus. We're, I don't know. Sometimes I do know students sometimes take it too far though. Like, yeah, I've heard like people, you know, they'll drop like nails in parking lots and stuff. I know yeah. freshman year I had a buddy that went to Henderson and he got like a nail in his car because people were like putting nails in parking lots and it's like, Jeez. dang. 
Maybe we might be going a little bit too far sometimes. Yeah. But. Well, I don't think anybody went as far as, I think it was maybe in the 60s or the 70s when um, there was that person that got kidnapped really? from Washita, I think, and it was a big prank. I can't remember who it was, but I think it was somebody that ended up being like governor or mayor or wow. s a, had a pretty big position and like their significant other was kidnapped and like it became kind of a police investigation because no like none of her friends were in on it and they called the cops because like our friend's been kidnapped and um yeah wow yeah. It, it became a big thing so yeah, yeah. I, nails and parking lot is not great but uh i think it's supposed to be all, it's supposed to be good natured fun so it is good natured fun um Except when the freshman girls dorm, all their cars got egged. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a pain to clean. Yeah. You can't really clean Messing that up people's cars. Yeah, and then I had seen last year just one car in the parking lot. Somebody had like dumped cake on it. Cake, and, and I've heard like flour and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I think the lightest. I'm always really paranoid this week because people will mess with yeah. your cars. You never know, yeah, you never know. Yeah. Hit. Sophomore year, I think somebody had gone in the, the Anthony parking lot and had lifted up the uh, the windshield wipers on everybody's cars to get them stra standing straight up. Uh -huh. The problem is I hadn't gotten to my car that whole week until Friday. I was headed home and I was the only one in the parking lot that my wipers were standing straight up. Everybody had already fixed theirs. And I was like looking around my car. I was like, what's, you know, what's someone this? marked my car? Yeah. You know? But yeah, it, it ended up being nothing. So anyway, well, thank you for tuning in to episode number 11. Tune in for the conclusion of Battle Ravine in episode number 12. Stay safe, have a good day, and go Tigers.